interesting, but I say many, not all. <coughs> there are too many essential demands to keep in our minds at once and deal with them all. And this inherent way of working is why we hear calls for more women on company boards, not just to be fair, but to increase productivity and profits. Women generally see more, including <coughs> risks. They have to, as keepers of the future. Our leaders are mainly men, and it is they who have sold out this future and reduced their responsibilities to winning votes. Now, my granddaughter would have been about four when I wrote this. The last time she was with me when I drove down the mountain towards town, there'd been an almost gale force southerly blowing the day before. As we reached the part of the descent, the descent where the view towards the Hunter Valley, usually with a very obvious pollution layer, becomes panoramic, she pointed down at it in astonishment. Look, Grandma! She took a few seconds to work out why it was so different. It's not yucky! <laughs> now, look what they've done to her world. Pollution mm. is normal. Think what they've done to her future, unless we tell them to stop. And I think we are getting there. But I feel as if I've been using, using nanotactics for years, as I gave talks on each book to unsuspecting city and country audiences, using a camouflage of respectable grey-haired grannydom to infiltrate a complacent society with my very serious, um, unsettling concerns. I would always dress conservatively. In fact, I think it's the same shawl. <laughs> so they did not <laughs> mentally dismiss me as other before I could charm them into hearing my message. In a long war like this one, until sanity descends on our leaders, we all need to use whatever levers we have available. And although I have occasionally seen older women being treated roughly by security mainly, but sometimes police, usually aged womanhood is advantageous. Um, sorry. I've been to many rallies since those early days and they keep growing in numbers and demographic range. For me, the first major sign that the mainstream tide was turning was this 2012 New South Wales Farmers Rally to protest against a draft strategic land use plan that excluded neither agricultural nor environmental areas before expiration. Most of the thousands in Martin Place had never been to a rally before, and as we marched to Parliament House, we chanted, City and country, united we stand. Protect our water, protect our land. It was very moving. Mm -hmm. And in an historic first, the CWA ladies marched behind their banner and the President stood up there to speak alongside the Greenies like Nature Conservation Council and Drew Hutton from Lock the Gate. People power is about the only thing left in our hands once the system fails us, as it has, and many, many people are now prepared to use that power. Women may have softer hands than men, but they know that the velvet glove approach can be more effective than bare fists. Bananas are non-confrontational, calmly knitting, causing no trouble, but stoically affirming the rights of future generations, swallowing no political placatory bullshit, and asking awkward and informed questions. Absolutely infuriating. <laughs> <laughs> now, during my research, I met many admirable women, forced by circumstance to become warriors for their families, livelihoods and futures, for their land and water. They had to acquire undreamt of skills and ferret out more in-depth information than a PhD would require. This is uh, south of Gloucester. A few locals have been battling for years to keep their creek unpolluted. Like Jenny, whose second bedroom is entirely, and I mean entirely, walled with shelves of fat environmental impact statements, submissions and documents on coal and CSG. Her only past experience with paperwork had been with the kids' soccer club. And they, she was working for over 10 years with a lady called Mavis Turstey. They were both living in caravans. This was pre-email because they, they were building, owner building their homes at the time. Now, Mavis Turstey um, worked, was really the leader there and the battle was so demanding that she gave up her master's degree to devote all her time to it. She only stopped fighting against the Durali coal mine in 2006 when she died from cancer. I'm ashamed of this land where people like Mavis are forced to spend so much of their lives battling to have concern for the legacy of future generations prevail over short-term gain for the corporate view. Mm -hmm. Now, my book is partly dedicated to Mavis, but sadly that Girali mine is still trying to get approval for discharge into that river. 
In rural areas, when the, the woman is usually the one that gets involved with all this research and legal stuff, but that takes out half the working <coughs> team that makes the farm viable and or the glue that holds the family together. And it goes on for years. EIS after EIS, court case after court case. That's Mavis. It's hard to make a living when you have to spend so much time. She did get a crossing on that particular river named after her though. Oh, um, nice. Um, yeah, and it's hard to maintain hope in the face of a process that keeps showing itself to be on your opponent's side and a government that changes the law to suit the opponent if you should win in court, even twice, as at Bulga. Mm. I know women who have fought long and hard but saw their families fracturing and for their sakes had to choose to surrender and sell, yet because of the enforced confidentiality agreements under which they now live, we cannot comfort them. They can't talk about it. I know women who are warily awaiting Goliath's next move, still living under looming black clouds after maybe eight years, trapped there, still poised, ready to resume the fight, and never able to relax into their old, normal lives and plan ahead. Many marriages as well as mines break under the stress. Now, I applaud all the women I met, but if I had to single out a few, it would be Wendy Bowman from Camberwell near Singleton. I called her the genteel guerrilla general in the book. <laughs> now, now in her 80s, Wendy was already a widow when in 1987 her first fight against coal started to save the dairy farm and the family's beautiful historic home. She lost, she set up a new home and dairy farm at, called Rosedale and started Mine Watch in 1991, travelling anywhere she was needed so others would be better armed than she had been with knowledge. Wendy, having been forced out of one home by one mine, is now fighting off another at Rosedale. Mm. You can see this is um, Fort Camberwell here, surrounded by open cut mines. That was only 400 metres from the nearest home. That was Ashton's mine. They now want to put another open cut here. Uh, now, <coughs> this time though, they can't mine up to a fence, ignore the impact and send her broke. They're offering her three times the value of her property because Rosedale occupies half the proposed open cut footprint. Wendy doesn't use email or the internet, but what she achieves without them is extraordinary. Like any good general, when she's not working on mine issues, she's thinking about them. When she gets too angry, she goes into the garden. She says that two of her three daughters think she's mad and ought not to be here, but in a unit in Sydney. Wendy, out of battle mode, doing lunch in Double Bay, while the Cold Wars rage on, doing more harm, never. The impeccably dressed Wendy has a great deal of credibility <coughs> at all levels and has helped the adverse impacts of coal grain gain much acceptance. Now, they won in court because the Chinese company Yan Coal, who also owned the Giralli and Stratford mines, uh, had, you could say, the support of New South Wales planning. It was rejected by both the Office of Water and of Health but um, somehow or other, planning decided they wanted a second pack hearing. In the meantime, the Office of Water fell over. Um, so we, we had a victory, as you see, big celebrations, and then within months, it was gone. Because to get this mine through, the village of Camberwell would have to be emptied for seven years because it would be unlivable. But we can't have people and the planet being placed before profit these days, so that's why eventually planning got its way. Um, we raised a lot of funds to appeal it, and that was at Wendy's place when we had that fundraiser. Um, but the, the decision came a long time later, but what it really means is that unless Wendy agrees to sell, that mine can't go ahead. Well, she doesn't and she won't. But this is great pressure on an elderly woman living alone, mm -hmm. even one who's now an OAM. Not just pressure from the company, but from the local town and the mine workers, who see her as standing in the way of jobs, despite the reality being that Yan Coal is laying off workers elsewhere in the ongoing decline of thermal coal. And I've been told really slanderous stories about Wendy, and it seems nobody is believed to be acting for the common good, as Wendy and Deirdre uh, Deirdre the Dauntless she is in the book, um, but also from Camberwell do. Now, another favourite woman warrior, woman become warrior of mine is Julie Lyford, ex-nurse, ex-mayor of Gloucester, rolled because she spoke up too much for Gloucester's general benefit against the coal and gas future of which vested interests were lobbying. 
She's the next council of our choice to become a permanent, unfettered advocate for community democracy. Full-time, unpaid, Groundswell Gloucester founder and leader, tirelessly seeking ways to deepen the capital fund of knowledge on her community's side, holding a volunteer research team together and full of empathy for the strain of fighting a prolonged war. At the Curry Beyond Coal and Gas Conference two years ago, it was Julie's shoulder on which I cried when the blackness of so many people's ongoing situations resurfaced and choked me. And I know that at the recent Ipswich one, Julie was hit the same way. Julie is diplomatic, warm and sincere and always credible, but steely in her resolve to defeat AGL and the bureaucracy that licenses such a company to take risks with the health of our people and our waterways. And I know that, like Wendy, she keeps copying personal attacks from those in town who still, despite all the proof, want AGL there. Like, and she admitted this in public the other week, malicious rumours spread about her marriage, her fidelity or lack of it, apparently with five different men. <laughs> her husband, Gary, a local doctor, can laugh it off and he said to Julie, well if you're that good you better save me Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> now I meant to keep my list today to three women, it's so hard, but I just had to sneak in one more before I go on to the last. The diminutive and politely feisty lobbyist Anne Kennedy of the Great Artesian Basin Group, uh, from a farm out near Kyamble, Kunamble, out near the Killiga, where she's raised district awareness to such a level and if it's not in the Northern Rivers, this is unusual elsewhere, trust me. My tent talk at the Coonamble show was broadcast over the entire showground. Her group has sold several hundred Richland Wasteland books. And the local produce store has locked the gate signs in its window for sale. Now, my other fabulous woman warrior has to be Paula.